Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I'm going to be taking you through a recently published Japanese paper looking at vaccine-induced heart failure. Now, you may think to yourself, well, this is just one of those cases, but I am here to explain to you why this is technically part of my predicted heart failure epidemic. If you've not seen this video, this was done over two years ago, and it was just based on the science around what would be happening with the, car, with the heart and autoimmunity. The problem we have nowadays is that everything takes time, and people tend to be impatient, and they expect things to happen instantaneously. And so when you make a prediction, they think it will happen right now. In reality, when we look at what my focus has been around autoimmunity, we're talking about a five to 10 year timeline. The problem is by the time we recognize this, there is very little that can be done. So part of my challenge is how to make people aware of that critical term that I keep on mentioning, STORM, the spike triggered autoimmune response mechanism. This is likely to affect multiple organs, including the heart. And so this is why it's so important. And I'll take you through this paper, a uh, Japanese study, just to help you to understand a little bit more. Remember, first thing, if you are on YouTube, make sure that you click the subscribe button. If you don't see it, there's usually a bell on the screen here. Click on it and subscribe. That way you will see the videos come into your feed when I do them live. Additionally, I want to make sure that you join our growing community. And what we are doing is we are building a healthcare revolution. So please join us at the Vision Med newsletter. It is absolutely free. Just put in your email address. And once you have registered with us, we will give you as a reward a free ebook. That ebook is something about nitric oxide and it's helping people to understand a little bit more about what is going on with the virus. Really important information. It's a free ebook looking at nitric oxide in the sinuses. This is where you protect against COVID. If you can prevent it breaking through this mucosal barrier, you will reduce your risk. This information is free. Please get it, share it with others. That way we can all learn the value of nitric oxide because it is so easy to fix just through humming. If you want to get the science around it, make sure you get this ebook. So let's get back to this case here. This is an important case. And in truth, when I explain it to you, don't expect that there are going to be any remarkable answers that you can use in your circumstance, because this is oftentimes related to older people. And because the system is not cued into it, the diagnosis will often go missed. And it's because the diagnosis is missed why I think the outcomes are going to be so significant in the long term. But there is no easy way for you to raise this awareness with your doctors because they may not be thinking about it. And therefore, it makes it very difficult for you to get in the middle. And additionally, when I look at this case, I'll show you that this timeline is very different to what can happen with many other patients. So let's take a look at this paper here. And uh, this is case of biopsy proven inflammatory dilated cardiomyopathy following mRNA 1273. This is a Pfizer third dose immunization. And so this here paper um, was published in July 2024 in heart failure. And they were looking at vaccine associated myocarditis following SARS-CoV-2 immunization. And they're saying it's mainly in young males after the second dose. And this was looking at a case in an older female in terms of making the diagnosis. Before I take you any further in that, I'm just going to quickly remind you about the basics with regards to the heart. And I'll show you a few images here to help you. So this is an image of the heart with the layers of the heart. And you can see here, this represents the heart, the heart muscles here, the right and the left ventricles, and the right ventricle pumps blood through the lungs, it comes back, and then the left ventricle pumps blood through the aorta to the rest of the body. The left ventricle tends to have more muscle in it, 
and this is the what they call the intraventricular septum four chambers and this heart keeps us alive if you do a section through the heart you will then see these different layers which i'll go into a little bit more detail in another slide and if you look at the muscle layer in in a microscope this is what it would look like so here is again a more detailed look a closer look at this heart as i said this here is the left ventricle the one that pumps the blood around the body and so if this gets weak or flabby it can then have an impact on how well the heart is able to function so when they talk about dilated cardiomyopathy what they mean is that this heart muscle almost gets flabby and it's like what would happen with a balloon you know if you've blown up a balloon multiple times it, the elasticity is gone and it just it, it blows out very slowly that's kind of like what would happen in dilated cardiomyopathy the muscle wall would get thinner it would be flabby it wouldn't contract as well and that's why the person would go into heart failure additionally you have to remember when we talk about myocarditis to understand the layers of the heart on the very outside is a thick um, pericardium um, this is like a, a bag, a leather bag around the heart to protect it. In between the heart and this is a layer of fluid. Um, that's where if it gets inflamed, it causes pericarditis and pain. That's what we call the pericardial cavity. Then you have the heart muscle, as I had explained to you. And then on the lining on the very inside is a thin layer of endocardium. And this part is what is affected in myocarditis, the muscle itself. And when we look at the muscle fibers, they would tend to look like this. They're very well connected with each other so that the electricity passes through it. And when the electricity is passing through, it makes a contraction. And that's how the heart muscle shortens and contracts and pumps blood. And what you would find in myocarditis is these then get inflamed. This is supposed to represent inflammation. With the, um, they, they then get inflamed. They then get fibrosed. So they don't contract as well. And so instead of muscle, you get almost thick collagen, tendon-like uh, material in the heart. So it doesn't contract well. It's difficult for it to work. And that's what would happen in myocarditis. One of the important points is that usually when this happens, it is very difficult to reverse it. And so this is why when we talk about myocarditis and when people ignore myocarditis, I think to myself, you don't understand the long term implications that come around myocarditis. So let's look in a little bit more detail at um, this and this breakdown just in case you can't see it because sometimes it is not necessarily available uh, or it is not liked to be done in such great detail you may have to follow me at substack so just look at that link below if you're not able to see this breakdown at this point and so what you will find and this is why we're likely not likely this is almost inevitable this heart failure epidemic as i said the the reason why it's an inevitable it's it's similar to what happens in sports so people understand this in football you have these footballers who are playing high contact sports they're damaging their knees all the time and they're still able to play but they then retire in about their mid 30s and by the time they're 45 they start having significant arthritis and that's because there was damage to the cartilage when they were playing sports. Now it was worth it because they were paid so much, but that damage can't be undone. And what it means is that they will therefore likely get earlier onset arthritic problems. So in the same way, if you have cases of myocarditis with inflammation, fibrosis, and just imagine that 10% of the heart muscle was taken out, in a young, fit person, they'll be okay. They will not have any symptoms. But when they are about 60 and the heart is under a bit more pressure, or if they had a heart attack or something, suddenly their reserve is not the same as the person who didn't have myocarditis. And that's one of the problems is people keep looking for issues now. And they say, well, we haven't seen any issues now. It's no big deal. 
That's not how medicine works. The damage that is caused now shortens the time frame for disease presentation. That's how it works. Now, that's a challenge because at the moment, nobody seems to be taking this stuff seriously. And so if they're not taking it seriously, what it means is that the damage is ongoing broadly across the population. Because I'll tell you this, she had no chest pain. And it would have been so easy in someone 78 years old, you know, she's older, she's now got heart failure. Well, you know, that's it. It's okay. It's probably just her heart is failing. They, you would not be actively looking for myocarditis unless you were very suspicious, especially if you have not looked specifically for the temporal association. And that temporal association is within 28 days of them having had the vaccine. Patients don't even remember. The doctors may not think about it. Nobody notices. How many patients have I seen like that? It's incredible. And this is why this is such a serious issue. I don't have a solution at the moment. And what I'm mentioning to you is important information. But I guess what you can do with the information is that you can be on alert for your family members. Meaning that if they had a relatively rapid deterioration in their heart function that was not directly related to a heart attack, because they would tend to know when they look at the echocardiogram, their ejection fraction is now 35%, they're on diuretics, they had no problems beforehand. You can do the work of looking for the temporal association. And at the moment, it, it, people may not take you seriously, but what happens is that if you then mention it to the doctor, that, you know, actually this happened three weeks after she was vaccinated, the doctor will have to then document that or make sure they document it. He may not take it, well, that could be, could be coincidental. But if everyone starts to do that job and everyone starts to look for it, very soon doctors will be hearing it all the time. You know, this person had the vaccine on the 29th of April and by the middle of May, they were in heart failure. Do you think it could be connected? M initially, people will say, well, there's no evidence. But over time, as you start to build the questions, it is natural for people to start asking, well, could it be? That's all we need. We just need the scientific community to acknowledge the risk first and then try and figure out how we can mitigate this huge epidemic that is sitting upon us. As I said, I predicted this two years ago. And it was just about the science, autoimmunity. If you have autoimmunity, you're going to get long-term myocarditis and heart failure. The time frames, however, are not so easy to predict. And the reality is that if we leave these things alone, by the time we recognize it, there is very little that can be done. That would probably be the worst outcome. And so there is still a chance that we can make a difference by raising awareness. And that's where everyone has a part to play. So again, as I close out, remember, join us on the Power of um, Vision Med newsletter, and you will get as a reward for joining our uh, newsletter for free, we will give you a free short ebook explaining about nitric oxide and how this helps protecting you against COVID-19. Nothing is perfect, but every little bit helps. So thank you for this more extended presentation. And if uh, the middle bit is, picked, is missed out, please make sure you take a look at it on our Substack, where you will get far more information helping you to understand what is going on. Have a great evening.